they said, we want to play Cowboys and Indians. But they didn't tell me they were going to tie me up. And they oh. tied me up in a chair. And one of the kids pulled a gun out of his parents' drawer. This is a journey. Let me take you on a journey. There will still be the journey. The journey. New sheriff in town. Name is the journey. journey. This thing is bigger than Nino Brown. This is the journey. The journey. What is it that moved you? The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. Welcome back to another episode of The Journey. I'm your host, Larry Robinson, and today we have another Memphis icon that I believe you're going to love. But before we get to him, we got to go to our quote. A life is not important except and the impact it has on other lives. That comes from the great baseball player, Jackie Robinson, mm. who became much more than a baseball player, but I'll let you do your research and find out all the other areas in which he's affected our society. But today we have a man of the black and gold. He's an alpha man, I ain't gonna hold that against him. Straight out of South Memphis, spent a lot of time in D.C., Harv I mean, Howard Law, I mean, the brother has done a lot. None other than Judge Tariq Sugarman. Welcome to the journey. What's up, Larry? Good to, good <laughs> to be back, man. Yeah, it's good been to a have while. you. Good to have you, man. Y'all moved into this, new digs and forgot about me. No, we would <laughs> never do that. We would never do that. But listen, we're going to start with the early years. Take it all the way back. South Memphis. Born in Lemoyne Garden. Okay. Yeah, really? Right there, Did, Walker McDowell. Okay. Right. Who was and, in the household? Uh, me, my mother, and then eventually my sister, my, my oldest sister. Okay. And then we moved from there to Worthington over in the Castilla okay. area. And where was Pops? Uh, Pops was on the scene, but he was doing his thing in the civil rights movement. And okay. so he was okay. in and out, and uh, I would hang out a lot with he and his former law partners, A.W. Okay. Willis and Ben Hooks, in their office after after kindergarten at that point. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. went to Bethel uh, Kindergarten, Bethel nursery, nursery School. Okay. And then from there, I went to Peabody Elementary. When okay, I, when I okay. Finished. Yeah. Who outside of your parents had the biggest impact on, on Tyreek Sugarman? That's a hard one to pick. Okay. Because I was in a community rich with knowledge. Uh, I was right across the street from Lemoyne Owen College. Okay. I knew uh, Dr. Price, Hollis Price. His wife, Althea, was my sister's godmother. Okay. Uh, and then I go to the office of my father. It was A.W. Willis. And we had, it's interesting because my father was an alpha. My stepfather, A.W., uh -huh. was a kappa. All right. And Ben Hooks was a Q. Oh, wow. And so I was engaged with people that were on the forefront. I had no idea. Okay. Uh, went to, um, it was a four-way grill, Mrs. Cleves. Mm -hmm. And that's where I met Dr. King in like 59 or 60. We would okay. go there for Sunday dinner. Okay. And I just thought he was somebody that was, had a pleasant personality. It was a good friend of my father. Uh -huh. He asked me a lot of questions. He engaged me. Okay. And uh, I had a real curiosity about who this man was that everybody was attracted to, but I had no idea. Okay. You know. So go back to the question. Okay. Give me one. One person that you remember that gave you a nugget, a life nugget. It's always got to be, got to be the women, uh, and I would say my grandmother, Gaga. Okay. My father's mother. She was okay. half Chinese and half black. Okay. But she introduced me to so much Chinese cuisine and Asian food and fresh vegetables. We oh. never had a vegetable that came out of a can. It was okay. always fresh and grown in the garden. So I'd have to say her because she was the one that nurtured me and held me up, even when I didn't uh, have the confidence as a child. I hear you. Uh, she was the one that, that, that rocked the cradle and literally guided me through my early years. What decision did you make as a young man that at the time you may not have realized it, but had a lifelong impact. Going to Morehouse College. And really? that, that was primarily due to the influence, influence of Dr. King. <clears throat> I had the blessing to be in Mason Temple the night of April the 3rd, 1968, okay. the night he gave his last speech. Right. And it buoyed me so much as a young black child, right. uh, because at that point I began to see hints of racism when we moved into a new neighborhood where we were the first African-American couple to move into it. Okay. And, um, it was at that point that I decided that I want to follow this man. Right. And then the next night to have my dreams crushed by his assassination. Wow. Uh, but me, Smitty Vasco Smith, uh, right. Harold Whalum, Skipper, right. uh, we had all made a commitment that we wanted to go to Morehouse. And I had some setbacks. Um, I mm -hmm. had ADD as oh. a child, and I still do. Okay. I struggle with it. Uh, and I was not functioning, I was not learning at grade level. But my mother had, as an educator, had confidence in my abilities because right. she knew I, I, I thought well. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't process my reading as quickly. 
My son just recently got accepted to Morehouse, and he'll be attending in August. Congratulations. So. <laughs> and I'll introduce him to Alpha. Oh, man. Ah, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Even though his grandfather's an Alpha. <laughs> oh, good. Hey, it's a legacy. So where did you make the mistake? Oh, uh, no. I, ain't made I know no you're mistakes. interviewing me. Ain't I'm no sorry. Made, ain't I'm made sorry. no mistake. Right. Okay. How different of a person are you than the person you dreamed you would be as a young person? Because of my learning problems, okay. uh, I didn't have the confidence. I wasn't comfortable making public speeches. And one of the things I did when I was at Morehouse, I minored in, in drama so that I could learn how to speak better. Really? Uh, I did. And, and that gave me a little more confidence. But, but it had to do with my teachers uh, helping me with my lessons after school. I would get tutoring. Mm -hmm. And that gave me the confidence going forward. And then my grades got better. Now so my, you never dreamed of being a... A police officer, fireman. I dreamed of being a veterinarian. Really? I love animals. I okay. really want to be a veterinarian. And when I saw the curriculum, uh -huh. all the math changed my mind. Changed oh, my mind. Wow. But then I, I was one of the first in at Morehouse to graduate with a degree in banking and finance. So okay. it did push me in a direction that I felt was productive. Fantastic. Yeah. When did you know you were going to be okay? When did you know, when you looked in the mirror and said, I can do this thing called life? My first year of law school. Mm -hmm. uh, because I'd gotten out of Morehouse. I did well. Uh, I worked for two years in banking, came back to Memphis and worked with NBC Bank okay. and didn't like banking because I wasn't getting the credit for my work. Mm. Uh, I was training a young white kid who, whose father was on the board with okay. NBC Bank. Okay. He was getting credit for my work and I didn't appreciate that. I didn't feel okay. that I, my work was showing some value. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to Howard my first year and I finished that year the top in the top five of my class, okay. at that point I knew that I could lick this. But I was spending three times as much time in the library as my co cohorts. Mm -hmm. And the reason was because, again, I had to study harder. I'd have to read a case two or three times to really get it and where they read it once. When you were younger, mm -hmm. did you ever feel any pressure to be anything more than a young black male? Never did, because my mother didn't want to put that kind of pressure on me. I came from a family of educators, and so she knew the pressure to get my education, to go on in college, uh, was gonna be on me. Right. My father had questions about whether I had the ability to mm -hmm. uh, matriculate in law right. and suggested I, I go to law school here so that I keep my job and then go to law school part-time. But I knew I had to go to HBCU. Right. And when you asked the question earlier, what was one of the most important decisions I made? Morehouse and then going to Howard University. I, I have a HBCU, HBCU background. Right. Uh, and it, it helped me because I grew up not feeling wanted when I went to Peabody, we desegregated the school. Right. And then when we moved to the neighborhood, we were ostracized. Right. And so I didn't want to be in a situation, in a place where I didn't feel valued. Mm -hmm. And I felt at Memphis State, the matriculation rate of, of African-American males right. was very, very low. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to Howard, I felt like I was part of something. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it really did uh, give me the confidence. Judge Sugarman, what's your why? Why you get up every morning and fight the good fight? Because my parents. Okay. Because of the values they instilled in me. They said, if you can help somebody, and it's an affirmation that you make with Christ. Mm -hmm. If you can help somebody, you have an obligation to do it. Right. And so that's the way I've lived my life. Every day I get up, I look for something to do to help somebody. And you touched on racism earlier in the conversation. I want to ask you this. Every black man typically has the moment when he realizes that he's a black man. What was yours? Hold on for a quick second. Listen, we'll be right back on the journey where Judge Tarek Sugarman is going to share with us when he realized he was a brother. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to The Journey. We have today as our Memphis icon, Judge Tarek Sugarman. Before we left, Judge Sugarman was about to share with us when he realized he was a black man. Judge? Well, 
it was when I was a black boy. Uh, okay. I was a child. Okay. We had just moved into a new neighborhood on Worthington. We were the first African-American family to move into the neighborhood. Okay. And there were two kids about my age that lived next door. Okay. I'd come home early from school the first year we were there, and these kids invited me to the house. We'd, you mm -hmm. know, playing out in the backyard. They said, we want to play Cowboys and Indians. But they didn't tell me they were going to tie me up. And they oh. tied me up in a chair, and one of the kids pulled a gun out of his parents' drawer oh. and put it on me and pointed it at me and said, well, you're an N-word, and uh, my parents don't like the fact that, you, you know, basically you don't, you don't belong in our neighborhood. Whoa. Their mother happened to come in, and that's when they got scared and put the gun away. But that image stuck to me. That's the first time I've ever seen a pistol. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're playing cowboys and Indians with some friends in the neighborhood. Some white kids. Yeah. Yeah. They tie you up. And go and get a real, actual gun. We were in the in their parents' bedroom. They tied me into a chair, and uh, had a, had pulled a pistol out on me. And I had to have been seven, maybe eight years old. Um, I didn't know it was a real gun at the time, mm. but, but when I reflected back on it, it okay. was it was a real gun. Wow! Whoa! 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 And, and let me Man. just say one other thing. I was, you know. <laughs> Obviously, you can look at me. I'm right. melon, melanin challenged, right. and I had a little straight hair. And uh, sometimes people would get confused; they would hesitate. Right. Uh, I've had situations where people actually thought I was white. And one time, I was playing with my friend Skipper and some other other kids in the neighborhood. We were playing right. on the railroad tracks at Glenview Park. Okay. We were under the viaduct, and a railroad officer thought we were trying to break into something. Right. I was the first kid running out from under the viaduct, and he had his p pistol out at that time. He hesitated for one minute, and I have no doubt. If I look in his face, he would have shot one of my other friends, but he didn't know if I was black or white. And I think that momentary second probably saved one of us from getting shot at that time. And this was in the same neighborhood generally. Yeah. Man. So, the word whooping mm -hmm. in the African American community means one thing. Yep. But I want to use it differently in, in, in the way that I'm going to ask you this question. When was the last time you got a whooping? Literally or figuratively? Literally, uh, had to have been a teacher in the eighth grade, Dolores Gilder, here at Bellevue. Uh -huh. You know Dolores Gilder? Uh -uh. John Gilder's wife? Okay. And um, my friends had pushed me into the girls' bathroom. There was a young lady that was in school with us that liked me and I liked her. Uh -huh. We weren't really sure about each other. And so anyway, she was coming down the hallway and she told my friends, can you get them to come to the bathroom? Well, they pushed me in there uh -huh. and held the door. Well, she comes around the corner they took off and I come busting out of the girl's bathroom. <laughs> and she gave me a real paddling. Now, I have had a whooping since then by my mother, but I was pretty much grown. I was probably a sophomore or junior in, in high school. Okay. I was supposed to do some chores and I hadn't. And she got mad and so I kind of talked back. She comes down and, and uh, she says, now, you need to finish all these dishes and I want you to mop this floor and don't say one more word. I waited and I heard when you hit that last step, I heard the crick. I said, one more word. And she comes running down oh, and grabbed a boom and was swatting me around the kitchen. But it didn't hurt me. Okay. So when I stood there, I'm just looking at it, I said, Mom, really? You know, that is when she realized I'm a man. And she just broke out in tears and just ran upstairs. And I felt so bad. It wasn't a whooping beating, uh -huh. but she beat me emotionally because I felt I really, really hurt my mother right. by standing up to her. And uh, it was that point, you know, that 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 I developed respect for the relationship and tried to communicate better with her. Hmm. Man, fond memories of that time back early South Memphis. Oh, South Memphis. Yeah. OK. Oh, gosh, I have so many of them, um, you know, playing in the in the neighborhood. Uh, there was a Mrs. Turner who uh -huh. was a teacher at Melrose, okay. and one of her star pupils was Larry Finch. <clears throat> and Greg Turner, her son, had a basketball goal in the backyard. Right. So Larry would come by in the evenings after practice at Melrose right. and teach us how to play basketball. He'd take us three on one, four on one, five <laughs> on one. He would lay down on the ground and throw the ball. I mean, he was, he was just amazing. Wow. And he had, a, he had an injured ankle. It was a high ankle sprain during one season. I can't remember whether he won the championship mm -hmm. that year. But anyway, we had the honor of carrying the ice chest, chest into Melrose Gym to ice his ankle down during halftime oh. so that he can continue to play. I mean, those kinds of experiences, you just, you just cannot trade. That's amazing. And That's so when, amazing. I, when I said to you earlier uh -huh. that the community was more important mm -hmm. than just one particular person because right. we grew up in a community where everybody knew each other. Right. We always looked out for each other. Right.
Tell me about your teen years coming up in, in, you were in DC? Yeah, yeah. What was that like? Now, okay, this is gonna get a little sideways. Well, hold on. What made you guys move to DC? My mother, that, see now you get into an explanation. My mother applied to University of Memphis Law School, excuse me, excuse me, University of Memphis, it was then Memphis State, right. to their master's program. Okay. As a Phi Beta Kappa from Wellesley, she was denied admission because of the Jim Crow laws. So they had a statute on the books. If you qualified, Wait a the your state- Your mom was a graduate of Wellesley, Wellesley and couldn't get in the University Phi Beta of Memphis? Kappa and couldn't get in their master's program. So they had to pay for her to go to the university of her choice. So she chose Johns Hopkins. She went there, got her doctorate degree, comes back to Memphis. Now they hire her, even though they denied her admission, she was the first African-American faculty member. Right. After my parents divorced, she decided to move to DC and teach at Howard. So that's how we ended up in DC. Wow. And that changed my life. And that- she In what made way? Me, uh, well, she made me repeat the eighth grade. I finished the eighth grade, ninth grade, went to uh, Woodrow Wilson High School. Right. That first year, we had a 60% uh, white population and 40% black. Mm -hmm. And we had a, a black that we had elected, a friend of mine, Cass Madison, as a school president. So we planned the homecoming dance. Beautiful affair, had a great time. And then our assistant principal got shot and killed and to steal our cash box. Somebody had robbed our high school uh, homecoming. And that was a profound experience. And again, I had to repeat. I had repeated the eighth grade. Right. It was that point that I decided to skip the eleventh grade, get back on track with my friends, and go on to Morehouse. Having seen that, though, that that traumatized me. As what, a child. In what way? I mean, what did that? You said traumatize you. What did that feel like? What did that do to you? I'd never seen anybody get shot and laying there with his brains on the on the floor of the hallway. And I knew then that I needed to get my act together educationally. I got more serious about my books, uh, and that was when I picked my grades up and got accepted right. to Morehouse. Otherwise, right. I probably would not would have not made it that first year. After Morehouse, family. I have uh, been blessed to have three sons, and now I have a grandson and a granddaughter, okay. and that has completely, completely changed uh, my life. Yeah. Okay, so growing up not having your dad there in the house with mm -hmm. you, and then separated from your dad. Right. How was that impacted? your relationship with your kids? I am more of a hands-on father. Uh, in his generation, fathers were not touchy-feel. They didn't hug their kids all the time. They'd come mm -hmm. and say their prayers. And, and some fathers were different than that, but they expected the mother to have the role of being the nurturer and the protector. My father, I remember when my youngest sister was being born and my mother was at the hospital, he had to cook a meal for us. Uh -huh. He burned a frozen pizza. That's how, <laughs> poor, how poor his how poor his, uh, his culinary skills, skills were. So I had tried, had, to be more of a hands-on father of my sons. Okay. I participated in sports with them. Uh, when my middle son was in martial arts studying Kung Fu, right. excuse me, I'd already studied Kung Fu here in Memphis. Okay. And then when I went to law school, I worked on Taekwondo and made the Taekwondo team, excuse me, at, at Howard. Okay. <clears throat> so while he was trying to master certain forms, uh, and they call them forms, some call them kata mm -hmm. and karate, but in any event, I decided I need to go in start practicing myself to teach them. Right. So I got and got back in, in shape and uh, competed. Uh, I did open hand forms, weapon forms, competed in competitions around the country mm -hmm. and got to the rank of number one in my open hand forms and my sparring uh, in, my, in my age class. And so at, at that point, I started teaching kids classes there. Right. Uh, so that, that just being engaged with my kids, I got them involved in outdoor sports, camping, hunting, fishing, all okay. of that. Yeah. Let's talk about your career. Okay. What did Memphis do for Young Tart? It gave me opportunities. Okay. Opportunities to engage with people who were uh, progressive, uh, on the front line of the civil rights movement, seeing how to organize, seeing how to put together political structures. Mm. And uh, we would go to these things called Coke parties. Okay. Well, it was Coca-Colas. It was, it was a tub of Cokes and they'd cook hot dogs and hamburgers. And we'd be in one of the neighbor's backyards and going right. around. Uh, I remember uh, O.Z. Evers and, uh, and of course Sarah Lewis and all of these people that, Maxine Smith, Vasco mm -hmm. Smith, Jesse Turner. Right. Uh, these were people that were icons. And, and of course in our community, they were just our neighbors. Right. Uh, and so it gave me exposure Ben Hooks. Mm -hmm. uh, when I went to Howard, uh, Reverend Hooks was, he had been FCC commissioner already, and he had already been a judge, and mm -hmm. now is executive director of NAACP. And so when he was speaking there, I told some of my law school buddies, 
come on, let's go, let's go see uh, Benny. I call him Uncle Benny. Uh -huh. And uh, they were like, you know this man? I said, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, he's family. Right. And it was like, wow. <laughs> but, <laughs> but those are the kind of relationships that we built here in this community. Right. Very I, when so. I eulogized my father, uh, he died in 2019, and we were in Metropolitan, and my yeah. grandparents' house was Caddy Corner from Metropolitan. Right. I talked about that, that neighborhood. I said, you can go seven blocks north, south, east, or west. You won't find a community in, in America where a black family, a black community has meant more. We had musicians, yes. we had doctors, lawyers, teachers, educators, yes. um, sanitation workers, mm -hmm. and all of us were part of a community. Right. My grandfather only had an eighth grade education, but he put two kids through college, one at, one at, uh, at Fisk, and right. then one on the graduate school. My father went to Harvard wow. and finished Rutgers. And so these were opportunities were given by being an association in proximity to people. Hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> great successes. What would you say is Tarek Sugarman's to date the greatest success? Haven't had it yet. Okay. Every year I'm building on it. You're building on it. You know, it. as long as you're alive, you need to be trying to build your resume of, of helping people. Okay. And again, it's a commitment to engaging and helping people. I was a part-time public defender for 15 years, and I was also in private practice with mm -hmm. the warden firm for uh, a good portion of that okay. time period. And during the time period, I had a, a pretty good track record of success in trying cases. Uh, Joe Brown kept a record, and he added up a pro I wasn't keeping. He had added up approximately 60 cases within a time a 10 year time period. Uh -huh. Felony jury trials that I didn't lose a trial. Okay. And so those kinds of successes, but you don't stop there. You keep adding on to it. Right. As long as I'm breathing, I want to be able to do something to help somebody with the skills that I have. I definitely would like to talk more about your career. Okay. Going into law, mm -hmm. you was in, you were in banking. I was in banking initially. And yeah. then you decided to go to Howard. Yes. Go to Howard Law, the transition out of Howard Law, and from there, where, can you take us through it to where we are? When I came back to Memphis, you might be surprised, I lived in the Pepper Tree Apartments. Now, okay. it's not like they are now. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was a nice place. Okay. Uh, but then, because of the desire to be proximate to my work and to the people I wanted to serve, uh -huh. I moved into North Memphis. I bought a house at 4th and Looney in the Greenlaw area. Okay. And at that time, that neighborhood was rough. Mm -hmm. uh, I would represent drug dealers, and I had it wasn't uncommon for me to have a tap on the window. My bedroom window was right on the side street of Fourth, right. uh, and it was one of the drug dealers I had represented. He had somebody that gotten arrested and needed to have a bond set, and uh, wow. that same relationship helped me. Or right. Relationships right. Uh, during a 1990 campaign, I had about 400 T-shirts in boxes in my in my house. My house was broken into. They stole all my T-shirts, but not only that, they stole some weapons that I had. I like to hunt, so I had right. a few rifles and a few pistols. Right. All of that was stolen. So this guy, Rick, I'm not gonna say his last name, but he came by the house, tapped on the window late at night, says, hey, Judge, hey, hey no, Tark, Tark, can you come out? I said, yeah, but what's up, Ricky? He said, I heard you got broken into. I said, yeah. He says, what'd they take? I said, well, it's not gonna make a difference now. He says, no, you tell me what they took. I wrote down a list. Two days later, every gun that was stolen was, take, was, was on my porch that was taken. And that, but then the T-shirts. About two weeks after that, I see people walking through the neighborhood <laughs> with my T-shirt. You know, both for judge, both for target shooting for judge. And, and so that's a good advertising. Yeah, oh, hey, and, and uh, but but those relationships help you. You know, oh, when you help absolutely. people, they, they return the favor. Any regrets? Oh no. Um, probably with my kids, with my work not spending more time with them. Right. And that was one of the reasons that I decided to run uh, and, and become a judge. I wanted to spend more time with them. Mm -hmm. And now in the position that I am, I have more time on my hands now that my, my, my boys are grown. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm looking to make some changes in, in our court system in a, in a positive way uh, at juvenile court. Fantastic, mm -hmm. fantastic. You're back in South Memphis. Young Tark is sitting there at the table eating a bowl of cereal, watching the Cowboys. What would you say to that young guy? Wait a minute, Cowboys? Yeah, watching some Cowboy pictures. You know, oh, the Westerns, I was gonna say, Westerns. not the Cowboys no, team. No, the Westerns. Yeah, yeah. no, the Cowboys, the Westerns, the Cowboys. you know. The Westerns, you know. Man, Dale Evans, Roy Rogers, yeah. uh, Sky King, yeah, yeah. who wasn't a Cowboy, but nonetheless, yeah. Maverick. Yeah. Well, let oh, me rephrase okay. this question. Okay. You bump into young Tyreek, Outside shooting ball, he, and, yeah. and, and and you walk up, you know it's you. You talking to this kid? What would you say to him? I, I would say, um, 
take time to enjoy your relationship, your friendships. Okay. okay. Because my parents, as I say, they divorced, uh, which wasn't the most tragic part of that. It was that I had to move from Memphis to Washington. Mm -hmm. And so I missed the relationships that I had here. I didn't go through high school with, with my group of core group of friends here. Right. And so when they talk about high school here, I'm not in that conversation because I wasn't here. But when I go back to D.C., then I have those relationships there. Right. So um, I, I should have continue to cultivate those relationships over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes distance makes it difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we came up, we didn't have cell phones. I couldn't just pick up the phone and call right, them because it was expensive. Right. Uh, but, but now as I've gotten older, I value those relationships. So when I run into friends, I make sure that I take time, you know, say, let's get together, have a, have a beer, go Absolutely. out and have dinner or whatever. Right. Uh, so I would say, yeah, take time to cultivate those, those relationships a little better now. Okay. Uh, and, and so, yeah, yeah, I, 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 would, I, would, I would give that young kid the same advice. Yeah. Well, boys and young men right. are sitting here watching us, mm -hmm. are listening to us. I want you to look in that camera and literally leave them with a Tarekism or Judge Sugarmanism mm -hmm. um, that they can carry from this conversation. The key thing is trust yourself and the guidance and, and education and lessons that your parents taught you. Because from that, you will understand how important it is to define who you are and not let other people define who you are. Uh, and if you carry that along with you the rest of your life, you will never be unsure or feel insecure in the decisions that you make. Have confidence in them, but then also build yourself and your character to be some th somebody that you model and would want to emulate. And that's what I would suggest. Don't ever lose yourself and don't let somebody else define you. That was the judge. You know how they say, here comes the judge? That was the judge. So listen, thank you for spending a little bit of time with Judge Todd Sugarman. Appreciate it. And myself. Enjoyed it. I'm Larry Robinson. You've been watching The Journey. Come back because we're going to keep bringing these phenomenal Memphis icons right to you next time. Take care. Thank you to our partner, the Grand Boulet of Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity, Delta Chapter. To hear more incredible stories like this, be sure to download the Kazookian app from the App Store or Google Play or check out the Journey Memphis podcast on all your major podcast providers. Also, check us out on the Kazookian Network. Kazookian Network.